Let's open it up to all of you for some questions now. We've got about uh, 25 or so minutes before we uh, wrap this up. Had a great uh, wide-ranging discussion here for the first uh, better part of an hour with our panelists. So I'll uh, continue to moderate if you could identify yourself. And if there's any particular panelist you'd like to direct a question to, that's great. Otherwise, I will pick out handpick volunteers to respond. Sir. I'm Alan Young. I'm retired. I'm a former TAG. Uh, I've been fooling the same issue for over 20 years, uh, back when Dave and I were in the uh, War College together. Uh, and it's the same issues. You can change the figures and the names, but nothing ever gets really resolved. And I'll address this, uh, ask a question about the last point first. Telling the Army story. I mean, the Guard is out there in 3,000 communities, and we tell our part of the Army story. We go talk to Rotary Clubs. You guys are over on the hill. We go talk to Rotary Clubs. And uh, we talked about what the Guard's doing. But the offer that's been on the table for decades has been we'd like to tell the entire Army story. That offer has laid, laid there untouched by every chief of staff of the Army I can remember. I mean, do you have any ideas of how we can break that? I mean, what the result is, whatever political clout we have, we use on our behalf. And whatever the regular Army has, they use on their behalf. And the other services profit. And other than a commission or a total force task force, are we ever going to get through this? Because it's not a new problem, and it's not just about money. The only way I would say you could break it is, you know, when you get a new chief of staff, make the offer again. I, I, I agree with you. I think it's, it's insane to not leverage the capability of the Guard and the presence of the Guard out there to tell the whole Army's story. I think the Guard is, is willing to do that. You know, there might be individuals who are not, but the majority get it. You, the Guard understands it's part of the big Army. And, you know, if you want to build that, that relationship, allowing the Guard to carry that message for the whole Army would be a huge home run. Why it's laid dormant, you know, I, I can't say why. I, I, if it has been, it's a mistake and it needs to be rectified. I agree with that, and I advise a lot of defense contractors, and when I go to meet with their executives or I may, I'm asked to make remarks, I always start with the same point. I tell them, your customer is not a military service. It's not an intelligence agency. Your customer is a political system, and you have to talk to it on its own terms. Now, one of my favorite home state legislators, Tip O'Neill, said, all politics is local. Well, that's where the guard, and to a lesser extent, the reserve component is rooted, to not take advantage of what amounts to a grassroots organization in over 2,000 communities across the United States in terms of trying to save the institutional army from what it went through after previous wars. This is just, it's not smart. It's a political, it's naive. This team should be working together and taking advantage of the places where it is rooted in the body politic. Nora. A modest suggestion for a way to start moving beyond this with a ne the next chief of staff, and I'm gonna pick on you a little bit because of your wording, but I think that this mentality uh, exists more broadly than your specific question. Um, you said, we tell our story, we've had an offer, it's laying dormant especially as a goodwill gesture if there's a new chief of staff who is committed to solving these issues, taking the initiative and telling both parts of the Army story through the Guard I think would be a welcome thing to try to reestablish good faith on both sides. I know it's not as simple as that, um, but I think there's so much distrust between both sides right now that both components are going to have to take steps like that to try to you know, prove to the other that they are one team and willing to work on these issues together. Very hard to do given the level of debates and acrimony that exists now. I understand that, but I think that's going to be, you know, whether it's with the next chief of staff, I hope it is, or with the one that comes after, that's what's going to have to happen to get to rebuild any working level of trust back between the components. I would love to take it away from the personality. I think General Welsh, when he came on board, um, had experience with the Air Guard. Uh, that stood him in good stead, but who knows what the next Chief of Staff of the Air Force is going to do. Uh, what I would like to recommend um, to any commission or total force task force is how do you incentivize that behavior structurally? Do you tie promotions to um, whether or not you've done a tour with the other component, right? Do you, how do you, how do you get that to be a structural thing? It's not going to solve 
you know, what do you do to get the next chief of staff uh, of the Army to listen to, to the guard story and integrate it into a whole story. But I think there are some structural changes that need to happen because the last thing I would want to have happen is it be personality based. It's great for two to four years and then it disappears into thin air. It's got to be within the Army bureaucracy. Um, and I think that's one of the things that a total force task force or a commission can help push is structural change. Um, and I think that's important to move that dialogue forward. I just had a comment which, which would be uh, something I heard in Afghanistan from one of their senior leaders many years ago is, is the, as they looked at all of the emissaries coming out to see them was, so many messengers, what's the message? So many messengers, what's the message? And I think that fundamental of what is the single army message that isn't just written by one part of the army, but is actually a message that has consensus and buy-in and commitment of all three parts of the army behind it, four if you count all the civilians in the army, that there is a significant effort undertaken to have a very simple, straightforward message that everyone of all components, of all outfits in the army embraces and can take forward. That's been missing, that's part of this telling the Army story as well, and it can't just be one part of the Army story. Robert. Hey, sir, uh, Colonel Robert Price. Um, you know, I think I heard a consensus from the panelists that uh, there will be a commission, uh, whether it's a good idea or not, but there will be one. And uh, one of the panelists made the, made the point that, uh, you know, this, uh, this public ACRC conflict is not uh, just bad for the Army. It's kind of potentially bad for national security at, at a much broader level because of the audience for that kind of conflict. Um, so my question is, uh, ask you to kind of speak a little bit about your thoughts on how that would play out in front of a commission, which is going to be probably a public, a public body. Um, do you see the sort of the give and take of the ACRC differences as a potentially uh, beneficial thing in the you know court of the commission, or do you see? Uh, the airing of those kind of conflicts as uh, a net negative? Um, I think when a commission goes and has their field hearings or if they have uh, meetings with senior leaders and, and even the working level folks, people need to be honest. And so I think the tensions exist right now. I don't see how it could get much worse by airing honest opinions. Um, and at that point, the commission will have full scope over, you know, all right, so here we've heard this thing nine times out of ten. We've heard this thing, you know, it's an, it's an outlier, but perhaps we should, um, you know, take heed because it's, you know, it, it could be um, severely detrimental if, if this happens. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm using vague terminology here because I, I don't want to <laughs> air tensions uh, publicly right now. But I think from a commission perspective, it, it has to be public and people should be as honest as they possibly can be. And then let the commission... Uh, take that information and do with it what it will. For what it's worth, I don't think that it could get more tense. Um, please don't test that. Um, <laughs> but uh, but I, that's just my, my opinion. See, I, I'd like to make a plea in, in the opposite direction, is that I hope that the, the two warring factions don't sit with their arms crossed waiting for the, the commission to be named, but that they continue working and come with as much consensus to that commission, because I do agree, I think inevitably we'll have one, but it would be sure a heck of a lot more beneficial to the nation and to the Army writ large if instead that everybody came to them and said, okay, we've worked out this, 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 and this. This is the only one we got left. You guys want to help us with that? We'd appreciate it. But if everybody just sits in their corners until the commission goes and then say, okay, you guys decide, uh, you know, I don't, we ain't got too many Solomons up there. Uh, it, we really, this, the Army needs to figure this out. The Army with a big A, all right? And, and if we can't get to 100% agreement, then get to as close to it as you can and then let these other guys figure out what's left. But please don't just sit and wait till the commission comes and think they're gonna be the savior because you may get something, and this is to everybody, you may get something you don't really like. Boy, is that true. You know, I've participated in several Defense Science Board task forces and uh, two base closure and realignment commissions, uh, usually on the sidelines, but still as a participant in the process. And what you discover is if they didn't start out already having some concept of what the outcome was going to be, then it just dissolves into a bunch of factions. 
and you get this lowest common, de common denominator outcome where the status quo is simply legitimized and, and no changes occur. It's much better for the entire Army team, reserve and active, to come in the door having already agreed in advance, here's what we think we can get out of this that we can all live with and try to sell that than to do deals behind the scenes with various members who were picked because they represented particular constituencies. But, but isn't that part of it though? I mean, part of the driving function for the commission is that to force the army and all its pieces right. to have that conversation before they have a public hearing. Well, I mean, yeah. that's part of the that's value exactly of the commission right. is to make everyone talk to each other. Um, and so I think at the end of the day, you will get those ones and twos of, hey, we haven't been able to come to any sort of agreement on these issues. Um, but you should know what our positions are and, and then back away slowly and see what happens. But I, and I, so I don't think we're necessarily disagreeing. I'm just saying the commission is necessary to force that conversation because if it wasn't necessary, y'all would have had it already. Norm. Yeah, I, I was going to make exactly that point. Uh, you know, it's, uh, the, I think the reason why the commission is needed is because of the logic of the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Um, you know, there may not be a whole lot that the active and reserve components can agree on in the Army, but I bet you can agree that you hate Congress for taking authority away and making decisions on its own more than you hate each other. Sure. Uh, good afternoon. Dave Wood. I'm the State Aviation Officer for Pennsylvania. Um, I'm not going to ask an ARI question, <laughs> but, uh, um, but I did hear General McMaster's this morning talk about the importance of the narrative of land forces and the importance of how we have to get that message out, but also what is the role of land forces? And he's got a pretty, pretty good idea of what that is. I asked him a specific question, what he thought of, was the role of the reserve components, in particular the Army National Guard. The one thing he did say was that it is extremely important that the dialogue of how the Guard is used is, is spoken about before before and not after the fact. He talked about the fact that we've got to incorporate the Guard into our planning sequences and we've got to move forward, as the panelists said, has one army. Um, so we've talked about the commission and we've actually talked about the Air Force with uh, their Air, air Guard and uh, Air Reserve uh, panels. What other things do we have besides a new chief of staff and a panel? What other ways can we do to try to bridge this dialogue that we're currently dealing with? Thank you. Just keep dialoguing now. I mean, that's. I, I tend to make the assumption that you know leaders are leaders and act like it, uh, and and I think we got the leaders in, across the army in, in all its components that can be those people who take the dialogue and move it forward. Uh, you know, if it took a nudge of the of the threat of a commission to to do it, I don't care as long as it gets done. But you know, the key is that at the end of the day, America has the best army it can have to face this myriad of challenges that are out there, not so one component or the other can say, eh, we won. Uh, you know, then the nation loses. And I had a, a wake up call the first time I, I got sent to the Pentagon, I was just in a one you know, month thing and, and I had another army colonel walk up to me and said, well, you need to understand something. The real enemy is the joint staff and the other services, you know, and I was mortified, you know, and he wasn't being funny. He was trying to give me insight. And I said, you know, that's, that's crap. That's wrong. And, and here it's even more than that. It's, it's the pieces of the army saying it to each other. We got to get past that. You know, the, the, we're not going to have all the money we need. We're not going to have the numbers we need. And if we can't get our act together, young men and women are going to die because there's another train coming around the corner, folks. It always is coming around the corner, and we never know where it's going to come from, how big it is, or what we're going to have to do to address it. So we got to put aside this stuff and, and work together. So I, I guess the only thing I can say is just keep having the dialogue until you come to an agreement. I think pushing for... Um a real advocate within the Pentagon is, is a good start, and, and, I, and I mean that on the civilian side. Um, you've got um, OSD personnel and readiness. Um, you've, you've got an assistant secretary for reserve affairs, um, manpower and reserve affairs. I, I think having someone um, within 
the civilian side, a political, um, really looking out for reserve component issues is critical. Um, and I think, you know, you, you have someone on the Army staff, you should get someone in OSD who is a very, very, who understands the big picture and the guard's role in that picture. The other um, form I think you have is the, the Council of Governors. You know, I, I, I know active forces um, kind of look at, well, all right, the Council of Governors, that's really do civil, you know, civil authorities, homeland defense, guard issues, um, and then we'll go and, and brief them on the ARI and other issues. Um, but I think using the Council of Governors to really push forward an, an idea of, all right, so we want the National Guard to be able to do all of its domestic responsibilities, but why do the governors want them to be able to be deployable overseas? Have that story told, have that understood about what value do some very politically influential folks have in, in maintaining capabilities within the Guard um, and why they, they think that's a good idea. I think that's another um, advocacy group that I think is underutilized. Let's go over here. Uh, Eric Evans, I work for a DOD consulting firm and I'm a National Guardsman. Uh, can you speak to the strategy behind having uh, both an, an Army Reserve and an Army National Guard and if you see that changing or not changing in the immediate future? Yeah, they do different things. Um, I mean, there's, you know, General Abrams switched some stuff around and, and that sort of thing, and you really need all three. I mean, it, they're not, just because they're, quote, part-time people, none of you guys are part-time, you work more hours than I do, uh, but it's, they, they do different stuff. You know, the reserve, the Title 10 reserve force, they're almost all combat support, combat service support. The guard is primarily combat and some combat support uh, and there you need both of them together with the active force to have a complete force that's not just a slogan right you got to have all of them and, and I think that's legitimate and and the guard is going to show up first in a domestic event you know the reserve guys now they finally got some sort of you know legitimacy to let them go do that stuff too uh, and, and then if you need it, you roll in some Title X active guys to, to work on it as well. We need all three forces, both domestically and overseas. Uh, it actually makes sense, as difficult as it is sometimes to sort out, uh, it makes sense and it works. And it works beautifully, particularly on a tactical level, uh, because everybody looks each other in the eye and says, okay, I got this, you got that, all right, let's move out because we've got to get the job done. We just need to translate that tactical cooperation focus, mission focus, up to the, the strategic level, and then uh, we'll have less fussing with each other and more serving the nation. You know, as chance would have it, uh, my family comes from Plymouth, Massachusetts, where the, um, the first uh, English uh, militia company was formed in, in the New World in 1621. It's 15 years before uh, the Salem Company that we now say was the origins of the National Guard. And uh, it's, got, it's now got an almost 400 year history under various names. But it made a lot more sense when the Shays Rebellion came along or when there were draft riots or when there was labor unrest in Lynn, Massachusetts. It made a lot more sense to send local people to deal with the situation than to send the Army active or reserve, which might have come from far away and might have had no grasp of the, the local environment in which they needed to operate. As long as we've got a federal system, I think we also need to have a, a federalized component of the military that is responsive to local circumstances. Sure, over here. Thank you. My name's Chris Biggs. I'm one of those retired, bushy-tailed creatures you alluded to earlier. <laughs> um, let me accept that and acknowledge that, that compliment, but let me pay a compliment back to you as well. This panel has been extraordinary. The concepts that you, you have uh, shared with this audience today are, are forward thinking, but let me ask, I know we're getting near the end, if you would take the, the great ideas that I've heard here and project it one bounce further, how would you address the, the leadership for our senior company grade and then junior flag grade? What advice would you offer them as to how to set their credentials, how to focus on the train ahead, and what were some, some specific things for some of them who may be sitting in the audience today some of them who may be the, the children who have yet to go into service, and I've had two of mine have, have been one in the Army and then one in the Marine Corps. So I think this may be a great way to kind of summarize a lot of the great attitudes and, and ideas that I've heard thrown about. Uh, since I got one of those young captains out there, 
Uh, look, the United States of America has, you know, all these services and then the components within the services. Uh, there, there's a lot of history behind it. Uh, you know, if we had to start over today, would we do it exactly the same? Probably not exactly the same. But you know what? It has served this nation for a long time. And every time we've used them, sometimes there's a little hiccup at the beginning, but by the end of it, we get our act together and we really do some spectacular things, way more than, frankly, as leaders, we generally expect they're gonna do. And it's because of those 18, 19, and 20-year-old kids who, who rise up and, and do what they're supposed to do. Sometimes those 30 and 40-year-old people who've been doing that job for a long time. Uh, but we need them all, right? I, I love the intramural stuff that we have between the services and within the components. I love that. I loved having a National Guard SF team who the, the youngest guy on the team had been on that team for nine years. Same team, all those guys together, right? They could do things that my active teams couldn't always do because they, they didn't even talk to each other. They, they knew what they were thinking because they'd been together so much. I've had other missions where, you know what, th those guys weren't gonna get up the mountain quite as fast as I needed them to get up there. So my, my active duty guys with the flat bellies and the gigantic legs, and they could get up there fast enough. It doesn't mean one's better than the other. It means we need them all. And young people, you need to understand that. Have that healthy competition, but don't let it be detrimental or damaging. Leverage it. It really works well. I guess one thing I would add is, uh, and I think it's, it's the biggest uh, stumbling block right now, and, and it's going to have to change over time, and it's going to have to change by leadership, and that's to move from multiple cultures inside the United States Army to one culture inside the United States Army, where all the elements have mutual respect and confidence in one another. We saw a pretty impressive version of that in, in the last 13 years at war in Iraq and Afghanistan. I've talked in a number of fora about uh, how my staff in Afghanistan when I stood it up was probably majority uh, National Guard, Army Reserve, and minority active army, and it was that way for probably two-thirds of my tour. I got very close to those folks. I knew what their capabilities were and walked away immensely impressed by all three of our components. Uh, but as soon as the budget knives come out and we walk away from you know, the bullets ricocheting off the rocks next to us, we go back into our respective corners of the boxing match, put our gloves on, and start going at each other. And, it, and the culture fractures immediately. And, and unless we can find a way, and this is going to take leadership in all three components, very powerful, probably most of all in the active component, because I'm, I'm from that particular tribe, and I think that's where the biggest problem is in a lot of ways. Uh, it's going to take a lot of leadership over the next several years to change that. And that's the environment, and that's the culture we owe the young folks coming up out in the forest that are the captains, like my sons, also two Army captains out there, uh, that uh, are going to be moving on through, you know, some very challenging times over the coming years. Uh, let's go, try, then we'll go here and then we'll come back over here. Good. Uh, one of you said that you're confident that the National Guard can perform any mission that they're called upon to do. Another one of you pointed out that given the nation's fiscal situation, especially projecting forward with our current debt and projected debt, that it's almost inevitability we're going to be working with considerably less resources. At the same time, there's been multiple studies shown that a reserve component soldier costs, depending on whose numbers you're using, a third or a half of an active component soldier. So if we're going to have to take significant reductions in the amount of resources we have, why wouldn't the active component bear the majority of those cuts to preserve a larger amount of combat power? I'll take that, because it's not all about cost. Right, this is why I said in my model, you, you know, I'd, I'd prefer for us all to think about forces in terms of the degree of readiness they need and when they need to deploy. Um, if it were just about cost, that would probably be the right thing, um, but it isn't. You want people who are trained, ready to go out the door, people ready to come in behind them, and so on. Um, that, the, num the statistic that you cite is absolutely true uh, when Guard and Reservists are not activated. When they're activated to full-time status, they cost just as much. There's debate about whether they cost slightly more or not that's irrelevant for the purposes here. This really goes back to the question of what do you want land forces to be able to do, and I would also add to that, in what time frame as to how you adjudicate what the right mix between AC and RC uh, personnel are. 
Isn't it interesting, though, that we've gotten this far into the discussion and the phrase cost effectiveness hasn't come up until now? Um, you know, whether you're in the reserve component or you're in the active uh, duty component, either way, um, when war starts, everybody doesn't head for the front at the first time. There's a rotation. And that suggests that it should be possible to reside a considerable amount of the, the nation's combat capability in the reserves at a much lower cost because they're at a lower state of readiness and still have them ready to go when they're needed. I mean, we're, uh, if I recall correctly, um, the reserve component com uh, consumes about 16% of the defense budget, but it provides over a third of the total force, all right? So, I mean, what that says to me is if you're going to be in a, a constrained budget environment and you know you're not going to need everybody during the first 90 days of the war at the front, then why not look at models where this is a total integrated force, but the reserve is maintained in a relatively robust state because it's the most cost-effective way to do it in a constrained environment. I'd like to comment on, on one part of your question, which was depending on whose cost you use. I think it's a shame that we don't have a common understanding of what costs what. Um, and I understand this goes back to everyone um, can, can manipulate numbers um, to their own end. And I think one of the recommendations um, Dave mentioned earlier, I put out a report earlier this year, um, one of the recommendations was to take it out of the Army and have the Congressional Budget Office, which is outside the Pentagon um, and isn't subject necessarily to the same constraints that the um, GAO is, and say, all right, Congressional Budget Office, what costs what in the Army? in the total army, not just the active component. And I think it really is a shame when it comes down to, well, whose costs are we gonna use? Let's use the costs and talk apples to apples, not apples to oranges, or um, as, as somebody else put early, in an earlier conversation, it's not really apples to oranges, it's like peaches to nectarines. You can recognize them, but one's a little, <laughs> goes back to fuzziness, I guess. <laughs> one's a little fuzzier than the other. Um, and so I just wanted to, to key off of that point is that I don't understand why we can't come to a common cost understanding, um, even if just for a brief moment in time, say, for example, one budget cycle, um, figure out what, what um, the, the cost of a, a soldier is. Hey, you know, that's a really important point. If you'll recall, the aviation restructuring initiative began in part with an estimate by the Army that it actually cost more to maintain reserve aviation units. And it's kind of hard to understand where a number like that would come from. We know that the reserve component uses less retirement benefits, health care benefits, education benefits, uh, you name it, housing benefits per capita. So how would they come up with a number like that, operating the same airframes? This will be our last question, and then we'll wrap up our panel. Thank you. Jeff Landau, a retired Army. I spent my time in the Pentagon, did congressional affairs, and back then, we still weren't the best on the Hill. So the story hasn't changed, and I'd like to stand here in five years, and hopefully we can fix that. Um, I'm a budget guy, but I'm not gonna talk money. What I wanna hear from the panel is the unique capabilities and the story you think should be told with the big A as we go to the Hill on domestic operations, on state partnership programs, on the dual citizenship soldier and that capability that the guard brings to the fight well you know that the big a piece of it you know not to sound political but you know you do need boots on the ground at a certain point if you want to accomplish something um, not denigrating our brothers and sisters who fly around in the air but you know we love them, we love having them there, but it doesn't really change minds the way, uh, you know, a ground force coming through does. Uh, the, all these different programs you mentioned, you know, are, are things that leverage. I was an attache, you know, I, I understand what the state partnership program does and what it brings that nobody else brings. And it isn't just because some guys in uniform show up, it's guys and gals in uniforms who do other stuff back home who could suddenly bring things to the table that, that their active brothers and sisters can't. Uh, a 
again, I, you know, I, I don't mean to sound like a broken record, but we need all those capabilities. They're real. They're not just nice, fuzzy things. All right, they're, they're legitimate programs that bring benefit to the nation and to our national security. We can't afford to lose any of them. Um, I can give you lots of other budgetary reasons, but the, you know, that's the bottom line. We need all those. They are legit. They do bring value, and it's value that's critical to the country. Uh, so we got to keep find. We got to find a way to keep doing these things. If we don't, the, the only ones who lose are going to be the nation. I might add something on the uh, civil military dimension you touched on there, which I think we under value and don't actually pay much attention to, and this may be another vestige of the active Army not being in all those communities around America, is that the, the Army National Guard and the Army Reserve uh, in many ways are the connective tissue that keeps America's military tied to its citizenry, that you've got a much broader representation across the nation through those two components of the big Army, of the total Army, than you do in any other service. And it puts a little bit different flavor on a deployment to Iraq or a response to Ebola or sending advisors uh, into the, uh, the edge of Syria if those are coming out of the neighborhood, out of the National Guard unit there, the Army Reserve unit there. And so in a way, it's the, it's the balance of the all professional, all volunteer force that still connects that force to the American people. I think we, we underestimate how important that is because we're constantly looking at budget numbers and we're looking at you know readiness and we're looking at responsiveness and when, a, when the balloon goes up, the, the fact that we still have a significant amount of our force and, and the Army foremost and on the service on this that touches the American people out there is a very important fire break to us having a force that becomes completely disconnected, connected from its citizens. And I, I worry about that some with the active side. I'm, I'm encouraged by what I see on the reserve uh, and the National Guard side of that in the Army. Terrific. I think we got a few cl closing comments here by uh, General Lyons to wrap this up. Well, first and foremost, uh, if you would all join me in, in thanking our, our panel here for their discussion today.